Hey dudes, this is Saratoga Valentine, MJ in the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, and you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Tommy's a free spirit who wants to know about your career and your belly button. You've been warned. Later, Tiger. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Shannon Farnan. You all know her as the voice of Wonder Woman in the classic 70s cartoons, Super Friends, and of course, the the world's greatest Super Friends, Challenge of the Super Friends, the all-new Super Friends Hour, anything with Super Friends in the title, she did voices for, but she's also been on some of the greatest TV series of all time uh, from the 60s and 70s, everything from My Favorite Martian to The Man From U.N.C.L.E. to I Dream of Genie, the very first episode of Night Gallery, which was directed by a young, then-unknown Steven Spielberg. And uh, she was in a couple movies, Against a Crooked Sky, Leo and Laurie, The Forbidden Dance, which was directed by Graydon Clark, another guest I just had. And it's going to be great having her today. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Shannon Farnan. It's Tommy Kovac. Yes, uh, it's Kovac, actually, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Kovac, okay, I got close, didn't I? Yeah, you're very close. Yes, at least you didn't call me Kovax. I get so bad when people call me that. <laughs> oh no, I wouldn't do it that badly, but I'm going to try to do my best from now on. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Welcome. How to are the... you? I am great. I am great. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Just fixing myself a cup of tea. Nice. Well, welcome to the show. This is such a tremendous honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm delighted to be invited. So, going back in time, uh, you came from a family of creative people. Uh, Your father was a musician, your mother was a singer-actress, and both of your sisters are actresses. So, I imagined uh, you gravitated toward acting early on in your childhood as well. Probably from the beginning, my sister and I had uh, a wonderful basement in the city of Chicago. And Mm -hmm. in that basement, on one side was my father's gymnasium, I called it. And on the other side was anything we wanted to create. So we created a stage and we wrote our own shows. And we started from the beginning. (laughs) Probably (laughs) five or six years old, we were amped at the time. What can I say? Yeah. Did they get you involved in um, school plays and community theater? Uh, not really. Uh, growing up, it was pretty much any kind of lesson we wanted to get, we were given, and it was generally in the way of performing. Uh, I was in my first piano recital, you know, in grammar school, and yeah, I just was, um, I wasn't really hooked into it in the way you are describing until I got into high school. And then I took a theater arts class, and then I was hooked. No more wanted to be a classical pianist. I wanted to be an actor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was probably the easier of the two routes, because very few classical pianists get mm-hmm. that very far. Yeah. You're, you're born in Canada and raised in Chicago? Yes, that's exactly right. My grandfather... Quite often you see Canadian actors. I'm not really a Canadian actress. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, my uh, grandfather was from Chicago. My dad was the first one to be born in California after my um, three oldest uncles and my aunt. Uh huh. Great place to be, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I've interviewed many Canadians. I I love Canadians. They are so free-spirited and not easily offended, which is uh, great because that's what I look for in a guest. (laughs) (laughs) Why are you trying to do a lot of offending? (laughs) No, not at all. (laughs) But sometimes uh, uh, words come out, you know. Yes, they do. They do indeed. Sometimes they should. (laughs) Absolutely. I have no filter. (laughs) Okay. Well, you've been doing a lot of this. I a peek at you a little bit before we spoke, so oh. I'm uh, delighted. 
delighted to be among your guests. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so um, so I was reading you you attended um, L.A. Valley College. Did, is that where you st- studied theater there? Yes, I did. I was a theater major and um, was very, very, I was a big fish in a little pond there. I probably did almost every leading role that came across the pipe while I was there. And um, really, that was, that was a nice place to be. I would have loved to have gone on to uh, a bigger school after that, but uh, life has a way of, of being Plan B. So I didn't do that. I I uh, finished the, the college experience at Valley College, mm-hmm. and then pre- pretty much got a job. You know, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to work. Yeah. So did, uh, it, was anyone in your class uh, go on to be successful? Yes, actually, a couple people stayed in the business. Um, one of them is a, well, he was an actor for a long time. He a, 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 obviously we're the same age. We were in school together. And we actually were in high school together. And both of those people are still at it. One is uh, Derek Lewis. He's a, now presently, he's a singer at uh, the Tropicana in Palm Springs. Huh. And another, another very close friend of mine, Jeanette O'Connor, is an actress in L.A. here. There's a lot of, she's a terrific character actress, actually. Should work more, but then shouldn't we all? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then there was another high school uh, uh, friend, too, I almost forgot her, shame on me, named Marlon Mason, who was... Um, acted in her uh, 20s, and she still writes and, and produces these little shorts that go around the country to festivals. So I guess once you get your feet wet, you just keep on soaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What made you uh, change your name from Sharon to Shannon? I, my first agent, actually. I went to an agent, uh, finally. I, I was doing other things until I got... Uh, 1964, and I thought, well, time to time to really jump in here. And so I was about 24, I think 23. They just said, well, you know what? There's an actress out named Sharon Farrell. Oh yeah. And I think I think it's too close to your name. I said, well, I don't really want to change my last name. My thought was, my father never had any boys, at least at the time. And I just thought I'd like to keep my last name. So he came up and said, well, he's the name Shannon. Oh, wow. <laughs> she, she's actually a dream guest of mine. <laughs> <laughs> just so simple, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you uh, guest starred on many classic TV shows. Let's talk about some. Uh, okay. Starting with My Favorite Martian. Well, that was a fun gig. I mean, <laughs> very funny show talented people. I just, as you said, a guest for the one show. But um, <laughs> it was fun. What could I say? All my jobs were, well, most of my jobs were fun. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, Ray Walston, he was a brilliant actor, but I know he hated this role. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people start out not being thrilled with a role that makes them famous. And gradually, I think as I see them age, they go into perhaps appreciating it more because the classic, you know? Yeah, I, I hope he did. I don't know. But, yeah, um, he didn't, didn't live through a ripe old age, so we won't know that. Yeah. Uh, Bill Bixby, he uh, was actually uh, a friend of my great aunt. Um, she was the head of craft services at the Hilton in San Francisco, and she knew all the big stars who came through and stuff. Uh, he must have yeah. been. He must have been great to work with. Very nice man. Yeah, speaking of a life lived too short, but very nice man. Yes, I find most performers. But you know, we go in. You know, we're there a brief time, and I think all certainly the regulars on a show always want to make everyone else comfortable. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's it's a very close atmosphere in many ways that everyone has got the same thing in mind and that they have a successful production mm. so yeah he was a charming man and Yvonne Craig I just uh, talked to Burt Ward about her 
because uh, she was on uh, Batman. Um, right. how, how was she to work with? You know, she was fun. We, we, were, we actually worked together on the show. I, I don't even remember what we were doing, but but it's not awful. I don't remember what we were doing. You know, <laughs> to work, you go home, you do the laundry, you know? <laughs> yeah. But she was very nice, and I, I would run into her occasionally after that for quite a while. And that's kind of what, um, what direction she took, you know, probably no more than I do. She had a huge, prolific career of... Um, <laughs> you know, of television and stuff that went on for years oh, yeah. and years. Yeah. How about the, the man from uncle? Hmm. Well, it is true that, <laughs> it's true that there was a lot of hair combing by the men in that show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, you know, that was a big show in the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They did like, uh, yeah. They did like uh, eight movies of, of that too while they were doing it. I mean, it was huge. Yeah, so I was, you know, I was kind of like my very busy time, let's say. <clears throat> I would say until certainly well into my late 40s, early 50s. But that was a busy time. And I was busy at that studio, MGM. Mm-hmm. How about uh, I Dream a Genie? Well, that's a funny story. I wound up uh, really spending the entire time, almost the entire time, working with Larry Eggman because we did a scene in a boat. And that's, you know, these things take all day long for many reasons. And it was a boat that split apart. So there were a lot of the technical things that had to be dealt with. But I wound up buying his car and his tent trailer. So we we got to know each other in the boat. (laughs) <laughs> I tried to get uh, Barbara Eaton earlier this year and stuff, and uh, I guess she passed, but um, uh, p- passed on the interview, not passed in a way. <laughs> I was going to say she did. I didn't know that. No, 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 no. I found out uh, something really interesting, though. The reason why NBC did not want her to show her belly button on the show was uh, because they thought that it was an enticement for what was above and below the belly button. Oh, well, you know, we've come a long way, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we think about it now, I mean, it's all pretty laughable. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting to find that out, though. Yeah, yeah. That explains a lot, you know. Annette Funicello, she couldn't show hers in the Beach Party movies. Right, right. Yeah. Well, look, at the, look at the bathing suits and the rest is explanatory. Yeah. <laughs> And it wasn't that long ago before that that we were wearing long legged with, with, with caps on our heads. So <laughs> there's yeah. a whole lot of history there with, with uh, showing one's body. Yeah. Uh, you did some episodes of um, uh, Dragnet and uh, Emergency. Uh, were, you, were you good friends with Jack Webb? I was not good friends. No. As I said, you know, I'd go in and out. And I did several of them. And he was very nice. Quiet man, mm-hmm. not not as uh, outgoing, but very nice. And everyone worked through a teleprompter on that show. And one of the scenes I had in one of the episodes was um, a little more emotional than some. And I asked him if he wouldn't mind standing off camera so that I could work directly to him. And he was very very accommodating; didn't bother him at all. But basically, you, you got to work alone in that show because you had to. Yeah. <laughs> but, but nice people, very nice people. Yeah. You were in the very first episode of Night Gallery, and you were directed by a young Steven Spielberg. Yes, indeed. I mean, we were the same age. Yeah. I should say we, we are the same age, yeah. And that, uh, I actually had a nice part. I was played the nurse of Joan Crawford, well, the nurse of, yeah. I was notified very early in the, by the crew that don't be surprised if a lot of my footage is not in the show. Yeah. The show didn't, didn't particularly like to have a lot of pretty women on the show. <laughs> so, sure enough, they were absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds unfortunate. Um, oh, you know, that's what they call showbiz. Yep, that's showbiz. Right. 
<laughs> wow. Did you at least meet Rod Serling? No, nobody meets Rod Serling because he never works on the show. He gets the intro. Oh. I shouldn't say nobody meets him. But of course they do. But he's not involved in the production itself. He just did the intro. And quite well, I might add. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if he uh, came on the set as a producer or anything like that. Well, if he did, he didn't show up when I was there. <laughs> and Gary Goodrow was in that episode. He's uh, one of the founding members of that comedy troupe, The Committee. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, he was also in the stage show for National Lampoon called The Lemmings, with Chevy Chase, John Belushi, and so many other of those great Saturday Night Live people. <laughs> just a few funny guys, huh? Yeah, just a few funny guys, that's right. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, I forgot to ask, uh, with Spielberg, though, did he did he have a uh, spark that maybe he would be successful as a director later? Well, I don't know. Again, he seemed very mild matter, you know, it's probably he probably was feeling his own intimidation in a position like that. Mm-hmm. But he was quiet, he was um, professional. But, you know, it's not something I certainly wasn't in a position. And he, at that time, he was just a guy. You know, I mean, yeah. he, he, I'm sure, was recognized by many as an up-and-coming director, but he hadn't he was still up and coming. I guess that's the way to put it. Yeah. I remember I saw an interview. Stephen J. Cannell said that him and Stephen Bochco were the two young writers at Universal, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And then Spielberg oh. Spielberg came as the young as the young, the youngest director there. And they, they used to call themselves the Three Steves. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but Steven Spielberg certainly became a giant in the business. Yeah, of course. How, so how did you transition into voiceover work? Well, I always wanted to do it. My goal was to work in every area of the business that I could uh, as a performer. I wanted to do movie, which I wound up doing. I wanted to do A lot of um, actresses at that time were, were starting to transition into voiceover work. Um, I, I interviewed a couple months ago. Do you know Susan Silo? No. Yeah, she did, she did a lot of cartoons in the '80s, and she had been um, she'd been acting and singing um, uh, since she was like 15 um, in the in the '50s and stuff. And uh, she transitioned to voiceover, and it's been very um, successful for her. She's been doing it for almost 40 years now. Yeah, that's great. I just kept doing everything. I just, you know, I never did uh, do anything exclusively, although I know many people in the voice business that do. How did, how did you get to be the voice of Wonder Woman? That was, uh, I had worked with the director on camera. Um, I did a Flintstone vitamin commercial with him. Mm-hmm. And he liked my work and uh, contacted my agent and said, I'd like to see her in regard to doing the role of Wonder Woman. So uh, they called me and I said, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and we, I went and we worked on the role in the booth and he presented it to the network and they bought me. So that's exactly how it happened. 
it's funny because for years until the internet came, I always thought that Linda Carter, who played you know Wonder Woman on the series, I thought she was doing the voice for the cartoon also. <laughs> Yeah. She did. Yeah, she did. Uh, I think the series two or three years. I think her show was on, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, think think so. I think about two. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, two years, and and I did uh, the voice for Wonder Woman for ten. Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. I found out that. Um, you you were you're you're officially the first Wonder Woman because uh, it was long before the series started. Yeah. Well, not long before. About four years. It started before her series, yes, for sure. But yeah. uh, both of both of them started. I mean, it, it just all of a sudden, Wonder Woman. The idea of Wonder Woman took off, which is delightful. Have Have you ever met Linda Carter? No, um, I have not personally met her. We were at the the film premiere at the same time. Well, premiere obviously at the same time. Mm-hmm. But uh, I I did not meet her. No. Yeah, I've heard I've heard mixed um, reactions. Some people say she's nice. Some people say she's difficult to work with. You know, the the the, the true makings of a star. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the rumor, rumor mongering is pretty prevalent in the business because everybody likes to think they know. Yeah. <laughs> so I always take that with a grain of salt. But I have heard her. Let's see, was I? Was I did I? I heard her sing. She has a cabaret act. Right. And I don't remember where or why I heard her, so but I did, and, and I thought she did a good job. I can imagine her having a good singing voice because she's got such a delicate voice. Well, it, she, it was just a good venue for her. The mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Cabaret, cabaret work. And, and I understand she has a successful marriage, and you know she probably only works when she feels like it. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Back then, too, you were all uh, recording in the same room, right? We were whenever possible. If one of us had another gig, they made um, accommodations for us, and we would go in at another time and just record in the booth. So it was uh, the most fun to be together, but, you know, we all had other work. So we all, we all were active actors, so... It was uh, the way we preferred it, but it wasn't cons- consistent. Oh yeah, like the Simpsons, they have that schedule. They're they're in at ten, they're out at two, and they only do it maybe twice a week. Yeah, that's pretty normal. I think we did it once a week. We were there for a lot longer than that, but um, no, that's about right. Four hours. Yeah. Yeah. We did it once a week, so you know, you get if you wind up getting hired on another job. You just do the do the work, and then Anna Barbera was always very accommodating that way. Nice, nice. But, uh, we're, we're, they were very good guys, I imagine. Well, I liked them. I didn't know um, Hannah, Bill Hannah, that much. He didn't show up that often. But Joe Barbera came in and popped into the booth every once in a while when we were doing the show. I told uh, someone the other day, I said, you can be like on a yacht in Venice and record a, a voiceover now. <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, the, the differences are amazing. I mean, I, I do this in my own home. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I sit not a, you know, the equipment, the technology, the size of everything, everything is totally different. Yeah. I mean, I do a, I do a, a YouTube channel when I'm in the mood to, uh, on any subject I feel like dealing with. And, uh, it's very cool to be able to be at home and do something like that, or audition from home. And of course, who knows what the world of showbiz will be like in the near future. Oh, yeah, I know it's scary. I, I was just invited to do a table read for charity on Zoom, which mm-hmm. happens to be a motion picture that didn't go in 2007, called the Justice League um, Word of 
losing words. Okay, it's called Justice League Mortal. They're trying to use a diverse cast of people who have done uh, this type of work in the past. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be done for charity. Everyone will be donating their work. The technical people will be doing that. And they should be doing that, I guess, this summer sometime. Oh, that's sweet. But making my point how things can be done. It's not the same. It will never be the same. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, it's really scary. I never thought this would ever happen in my lifetime, at least. Uh, but, but on the show, on the shows, though, uh, you, you worked with some pretty talented people. You had Casey Kasem was Robin on on one of the cartoon shows. Uh, Ted Cassidy, who's best known as Lurch, uh, you know, on the Adams Family, um, was was on uh, one of the cartoon shows. Well, no, too. no, Ted, Ted Cassidy was on the Mary Tyler Moore show. That was his best known thing. Oh, no, that's Ted Knight. Oh, I'm sorry. Ted Knight, you're <laughs> correcting me again. <laughs> All those Ted's were a dime a dozen, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> you're right, you're right, yeah. Yeah. Ted Cassidy. I, I'm, I, did I work with Ted Cassidy? Um, maybe. I think it was Challenge. I think it was Challenge of the Superheroes. Okay, okay. Challenge of the Super Friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it got bigger at that point. Yeah, maybe they brought in a lot of uh, uh, extraneous characters, so that's probably when. Yeah, Hanna-Barbera did that. They would always, um, you know, come up with a character, and they would always have different variations of the show. Like, there were so many Scooby-Doo shows. Yes, yes. Well, speaking of Casey Kasem, yeah. I mean, he's, <laughs> he was a lot of trauma. I, I, that was a sad ending for him, but I tell you, he was a very talented, a good man to know, very generous. Oh, that's good that he was that he was that he was good. I mean, he seemed he seemed like it, you know. And he was a funny guy too. He used to uh, do the Dean Martin roasts, and I re- I remember one time they're roasting Don Rickles, you know, the great insult comic, and Casey Kasem mm-hmm. comes out. Um, uh, Dean Dean Martin announced him as Don Rickles' writer. Casey Kasem comes out as Hitler. <laughs> it was hilarious. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> Oh, we said been there. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can go on YouTube and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. I just see that. And it was a Don Rickles roast? Yeah, for, for Dean Martin roast for Don Rickles. Oh, I'll, I'll look it up. Thanks. Yeah, you'll love it. And by the way, if you uh, subscribe to my channel, I will subscribe to yours. It's a deal. I hope I get enough uh, energy to put another one up there. I haven't done a channel since April. Oh. <laughs> Really? Even with all this downtime? <laughs> no, I just haven't. You know, if I if I don't think it's something interesting, it's not it's my my channel doesn't gear around any one individual thing. Mm-hmm. If I want to share something about an item or an event or something, then I'll I'll do a short video or it could be anything. But mm-hmm. um, I don't know, I think that this particular we we'll call it shutdown or COVID, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It, um, it made us all a little more introspective. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel like anything trivial was appropriate to do at the time. Yeah. And so, so I just decided, okay, so if I don't feel like doing one, that's just fine, too. It's also made a lot of people... Um uh, attention grabbing too. You've seen these like major celebrities making videos and they're just being yeah, silly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't get I, that. I know. I know. Well, I know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> you did some uh, movies as well. Uh, you did a Western called Against a Crooked Sky. Yeah, I did. That was when. Oh, a long time ago. That was the early <coughs> um, mid seventies, maybe, or towards late seventies. Seventy-five. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that was uh, with a uh, Mormon production company out of Utah, and I wound huh. up doing another one for them as well. Uh, totally different. It wasn't a western. Mm-hmm. Good group of people, nice group of people. I worked in, in Utah several times because I used to do the uh, 
the summer commercials for Western Airlines. I was their summer spokesperson for all the vacation tech stuff. Mm -hmm. So we shot in the uh, Osmond Studios up there. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a very nice place. Did you uh, meet them? No, they weren't there. They were probably on the road making a fortune. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Sure. Uh, Richard Boone is in it. Uh, God, he was a great actor. He was. He was a great drinker, too. Really? <laughs> he really was, yeah. That's probably why uh, that's probably why he, he left the world so uh, early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he kind of looked like a drinker, and he sure as heck was. I, I wasn't, but he was fun to watch. Yeah. It, um, he, and also, too, he was one of the earliest guys... Uh, from that post World War II uh, breed of actors who like uh, hit it big in Hollywood after coming from the actor studio. You know, I didn't know that. You're just a wealth of information. Yeah, <laughs> I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when actors get together on a location, that's at least my experience. You don't sit around talking about yourself, so it's not necessarily something you would learn unless you knew someone for some time. Yeah. Not unless they're doing an interview, they're talking about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you have to do your homework, but I, I don't. <laughs> yeah. You did a, a movie with um, uh, that Jerry Paris directed called Leo and Lori. Oh, yes. I loved that movie. I loved doing the part. It was a fun, fun part. I was an outrageous actress. <laughs> I talked to you. <laughs> I talked to Jerry Paris's daughter uh, last summer, and um, I've, I've talked to a few people uh, who worked with him. You know, they said he can be uh, kind of tough. Uh, did you find that in him? Um, you know, there were so many people on the set. Uh, I, I don't remember him being tough. I thought he was really, really helpful. Really, um, mm -hmm. he worked with you, in other words. Not, not every director does, you know. It's like, okay, action, and then it's cut. The sub directors. Now you have to assume because you don't want to feel badly about yourself. You have to assume, oh, oh I must have done a good job. Yeah. An actor, an actor always likes input because this is a collaborative business. Right. And what you see with your eye, your lens, your position is maybe different than what I'm seeing in mine. Right. And, and so I thought he was he was very helpful. And he was funny. Uh, you know, he uh, comes from that line of funny guys. Again, the, the lovely comedian that just died. Uh, Carl Reiner. Oh, yeah, they were... They were buddies. Oh, Rob Reiner was, I think, on the set. I think he may have produced that movie or something. Yeah, you worked with him later on Rumor Has It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and my stuff is not on film anymore. I, I think they deemed it unimportant for the the movie. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, honey, like I said, that show is. Yeah. <laughs> then you did the uh, the forbidden dance. Yeah, that was another fun part. A very prejudiced, prejudiced woman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with, with a Mexican name. <laughs> yeah, another fun part, though. I, I just talked to Graydon Clark. We didn't get into this movie, but... Uh, uh, he told me some great stories. He's a great guy. Very nice. Very easy to get with. Yeah. Very. We, we just lost um, the great actor Sid Haig. Uh, do you remember much about him? I don't. I, I know who that is, but I do not remember much, no. Okay. So do you uh, still do voiceover work when uh, the pandemic isn't happening? Well, I'm still available, and uh, although my agent was in a transition where the voiceover agent is being replaced or has been for all I know by now. So the question should come later when we know if we're still working at all. Yeah. But I'm at the point in my life where, you know, if a job comes along, great, I love it. You know, I'd love, love the work, but I don't, definitely don't have the motivation that I had when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure financially you're stable enough where you can pick your projects. I am stable enough, but I'll tell you, you know, an actor has to, has to, has to be, has to act. So if something comes along, it's never going to be an issue about money. Oh, 
that's good. But it, you know, for me at this point, you know, if it's just so water, if it's a part that you know is not going to challenge me in any way, which is likely to happen because it's been so long since mm-hmm. I was on the screen in a part, uh, there'd be no reason for me to do it. I, I'm way past having to prove anything, and so if I don't have a challenge for myself. You know, then it's just sort of a call it in. Mm-hmm. Are you worried about the Are you worried about the future of Comic Cons? Well, of course, I'm not worried because change happens in life. But I'm I'm concerned whether or not there will ever be any crowd gathering. Comic Con is just one example. I mean, I miss going to the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, I I'll never understand why we can't just keep a social distance with masks on in the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I mean, there's too many, there's too much confusion with everything because nobody really knows much. But nobody's willing to say, gosh, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's we all a... want to sound like experts, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, we all want to sound like experts, exactly. You know, it's true. It's sad, but it's true. But then it just come out in the beginning and said, look, guys, we got a nasty virus coming. We don't know a thing about it. Yeah. I, all I can do is hope and be optimistic. Well, there's no point in not having optimism for the future. But I think it's a sensational time in, in history for the consciousness raising of, of mankind in many, many areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to mention to you, your sister Darlene is great in The Beguiled. Yes, she's great. She's great in everything. <laughs> yeah. That movie is a classic. Yeah, that was sweet. She was a young girl then. Yeah, she ironically worked with another um, voiceover legend, Pamela Ferdin. Well, she, you, Darlene and I are very close. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be helping her get settled in the move she's making uh, next week. Or week and a half. And um, she. She's not interested in doing any more work, but she enjoyed the work while she, while she did it. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's a great movie. Well, Shannon, I thank you so much for coming on today. Well, it's delightful to talk with you, and I hope you just keep on a rolling with all these podcasts and uh, remain so informed about the business that somebody will have to ask you questions one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so blessed with all the people that I get to talk to. And I'm going to keep doing it as long as I can, as long as everybody in the world is, is healthy. And I just, yeah, I want to. We can all listen. And you know what? I may call you to find out about some of these things one of these days. Well, <laughs> if you do call me, I, I'm going to um, message, I'm going to email you my cell phone number because this is my landline I use, you know, for the uh, okay. podcast and stuff. Well, okay. Shannon. God bless you, and have a wonderful day. And you too, Tommy. The best of everything. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Shannon Farnan. Ain't she a sweetheart? What a great lady. I loved talking to her. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman! I'm sorry, that's the Linda Carter version. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.